and Professor Ashish Sasa was here, that it's the last seminar. But you never say last because there's always another one, which is obviously very exciting. And uh, we met by chance at the Indian Council of World Affairs, and uh, it was very interesting uh, panel discussion. But this is really set in hardcore Israel studies. So welcome, Professor David Newman. Uh, to General Center for Israel Studies at uh, General School of International Affairs. So Professor Newman holds Chair of po Geopolitics in the Department of Politics and Government at Ben Gurion University of the Negev. He was educated at the University of London and University of Durham. Uh, he's been uh, at Ben Gurion since 1987 and is responsible for founding the Department of Politics and Government at the uh, University. Formerly, he was the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and the Social Sciences. Professor Newman was editor of the international journal Geopolitics from 1998 to 2014. His research interests focuses on territorial dimensions of ethnic conflict and in the recent years has addressed the contemporary role of borders and boundaries in a changing world. His publications include papers, chapters dealing with um, the West Bank settlement process and the changing dynamics of the West Bank boundary, the Green Line, and the separation barrier. In addition to his academic work, Professor Newman was known for his weekly political comment commentary in the Jerusalem Post from 2000 to 2016 and was awarded the Order of the British Empire for his uh, work in strengthening and promoting academic and scientific cooperation between Israel and the United Kingdom in 2013. He is presently a visiting professor of geopolitics at South Asian University in, in Delhi. Uh, he's been here since January and we only met in May, but better late than never, we are here. So, uh, Professor, over to you. Okay, thank you very much for having me here. And I'm glad just before I leave India, I discover another university in the Center for Israel Studies. Um, what I would like to do today is I'd like to talk about the changing dynamics of territory and borders within the context of the Israel-Palestine conflict. Um, I do have a, an interesting uh, documentary we made about it as part of a European borders research project, but that will have to wait till the end. And um, if necessary, I can always leave the file here. Actually, it can actually be found on YouTube and you can actually watch it afterwards at your own leisure. Uh, to complement what I'm going to say uh, today. I want to talk about this slide that you see um, behind me or in front of you, um, and that is the slide of uh, um, a map, a caricature, I collect border caricatures, showing uh, various diplomats and politicians and academics trying to redraw the border between Israel and the West Bank as part of the, what we uh, discuss so much, the so-called two-state solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict. Obviously, there are many, many dimensions of um, conflict resolution, of peace processes, if they be, and I'm sure as you're all students of Israel studies, you know that it's about refugees, it's about uh, water, it's about borders, um, it's about Jerusalem, um, it's about security and a few, it's about history and identity. It's about many, many different dimensions and many different aspects. I'm particularly interested in the territorial focus. Uh, my wider work, academic work, is in geopolitics. It's on the theorization of borders in the modern era. My local case study is, of course, Israel Palestine. I actually reside, live, in a community of Metar, just three kilometers south of the southernmost point of the West Bank. And when I choose to drive to Jerusalem, I can choose to drive around the West Bank at 120 kilometers or straight through the West Bank at 70 kilometers. A little bit more dangerous. Um, it used to be a lot quicker, but with the new cross highway in Israel, I'm not sure it's quicker. But of course, for some, but and when I do that, I cross two borders. I go into the West Bank, at one end, I come out of the West Bank, Negush Etzion at the other end, and these are real borders. I mean, they may only be called separation barriers or security fences, but they are real borders. Your car is checked, your papers are checked, depending on whether you're Israeli or Palestinian, you're allowed to cross. 
depending on what your license plates on the car are. So there are visual elements and documentation which enable you to cross from one side of the border to the other side of the border. And I want to talk around this context of borders and territory over the next 40, 45 minutes, um, show you a few uh, slides, and maybe open it up for discussion. Leave some uh, very open questions, not very clear conclusions at the end. I think there are about six or seven points I want to make um, during uh, this short presentation. Point number one, Israel has five borders. Five borders or potential borders. Um, with Lebanon, with Syria, with Jordan, with Egypt, and maybe with a future Palestinian state, but clearly with the West Bank today, it has a border, separation barrier. Of those five borders, two are recognized internationally as international borders, the border between Israel and Egypt and, and the border between Israel and Jordan, by virtue of the fact that Israel has signed um, a peace agreement with each of those countries. Camp David, peace agreement with Egypt at the end of the 70s, the early 80s, which formalized the withdrawal from the Sinai Peninsula and the eventual determination or international delimitation of the border between Israel and Egypt. Um, one small point, the Taba um, went to international arbitration. It was eventually decided it would go to Egypt. And we have an international border with Egypt. A few years later, in the mid-1990s, Israel signed a peace agreement with Jordan. And the border between Israel and Jordan was formalized, or at least part of the border between Israel and Jordan was formalized. The section from the West Bank going north to the border with Syria, and the section from the south of the West Bank going south along the Arava, the Jordan Valley, the Arava, as far as Egypt, were formalized. But Jordan refused to sign on the border between Israel, between the West Bank and Jordan, because they said this was for a future Palestinian authority to sign. It wasn't for Israel to sign, even though we know exactly where that border is. It's along the Jordan River, uh, or what used to be called the Jordan River. It's not much of a river these days. Um, but we know exactly the location, just as we knew the location of most of the Israel-Egypt border. But by virtue of the peace agreements, these are internationally recognized borders. The borders with Lebanon and Syria are not recognized internationally. With Lebanon, it is the armistice line from 1948. Um, remember that following the war, Israel's war of independence, the Palestinian Nakba, that there were five separate negotiations which took place between Israel and her neighbors. And although their lines were drawn, they were not part of a formal peace agreement as such. And therefore, to this day, they are armistice lines only. Yes, in many cases, we know exactly where the line will be, or 95%. Nevertheless, they have not been part of a formal peace agreement between Israel and Lebanon. We were, of course, much closer to signing a peace agreement with Lebanon in the past than we are today. Today, it's a very sensitive border. Um, and when Israel withdrew from Lebanon after its uh, occupation of that area for from the 1980s through to the year 2000, it withdrew to that same international line which had been drawn up as the line between the British and the French mandates going back almost 100 years um, to the uh, um, imposition of the mandates on the region after World War I and after the breakup of the Ottoman Empire. The border between Israel and Syria, of course, is much more questionable because the armistice line which was agreed upon in 1948-49, was down by the Sea of Galilee, the Kinneret. In 1967, of course, Israel captured, conquered, liberated, used whatever term you feel happy with. I'm not here to engage in a sort of a political polemic over the terminologies we use. Um, but of course, Israel now controls or occupies the Golan Heights. And um, if and when there is ever to be any form of agreement or conflict resolution between Israel and Syria, um, the Golan Heights is a major issue which has to be determined. Of course, today the issue with it between Israel and Syria is far, far more sensitive than it's probably been at any point in the last 30 or 40 years because of what's been going on and which is happening right now.
with Iranian influence, with Hezbollah influence, with the Syrian state, not clear where it stands. Um, and of course, most recently, President Trump has made a very uh, significant statement about whether Israel has a right to claim sovereignty over parts of the Golan Heights, which in a sense has turned the cards because this is a statement which has never been made before, not by an American president and not by other world leaders. And then there is a fifth potential border between Israel and a future Palestinian state. Um, the border that we know, the one you see on this slide here, is of course the Green Line, which was also drawn up as part of the armistice talks in 1949. Jordan was then administered or controlled the West Bank. Um, and the Green Line, as we know it, is the border, the, in a sense, the default boundary. But um, I think it's clear to everyone engaged in conflict resolution that if there was to be a satisfactory border between a future two-state solution, the Green Line is by no means the optimum line, not for either of the two sides, and an optimal solution would necessitate the redrawing of that border. Um, it wasn't an optimal line in 1949, um, and certainly 70 years have gone. I'm going to say something about this time differential in a few minutes, uh, but clearly it would really need to be a bilaterally negotiated line. What we have today is the separation barrier, um, or the security barrier, is only 70% along the Green Line, 30% it deviates from the Green Line where settlements have been built, and of course it's a border which is unilaterally imposed by Israel. It's not the separation barrier, it's not a line or a barrier which has been agreed by both sides. So that's point number one within the wider context of borders. There are five borders out there. Israel, um, I don't like using the unique discussions about Israel. We do it a bit too much. Um, but in this sense, Israel is unique in the sense that most of its borders, are land borders, are not internationally agreed borders, whereas that tends to be, although it tends to be a bit of a passe situation, in international relations and international politics, there are many issues relating to borders today which we as border scholars deal with, but they are not so much involved with the delimitation, the demarcation issues. They're more involved with the management, the negotiation of borders, um, how they are controlled, how they are managed, who's allowed to cross, whether we're rebuilding the walls as is, uh, is happening a lot today because of securitization and homeland politics. But the actual location, the demarcation of 98% of the world's land borders is there. That's not an issue. One or two cases in the world where it's still an issue, Israel is one of those cases. Point number two, very important to make, and since you all study Israel, I assume I don't have to belabor this point, we're talking about a very small piece of real estate. The whole of Israel and the occupied territories is 25,000 square kilometers. Take out the West Bank, the Golan Heights, and the Gaza Strip, and we're down to 20,000 square kilometers. Um, I don't need to tell you that uh, in the context of where I'm sitting today in India, um, that's not just small, that's minuscule. Um, I think people in the world realize that Israel is a small state, makes a lot more noise than its size should allow for, but they don't realize just how small it is. And you know, when you remember that the um, closest point between the coastal plain and the West Bank from about the town of Netanyahu is no more than 15 kilometers, I mean, you know, you don't even get through a third of Delhi on that. Um, so, uh, you know, we have to take that into context. Over 70 years, if you look at three of the major parameters of political decision-making, two have changed significantly, one has not changed at all. Demography has changed over 70 years, or over 80 years. Uh, when Israel was established, there were approximately six, 700,000 Israeli stroke Jews. Um, a similar number of Palestinians became refugees. Um, and um, there were, of course, another few hundred thousand Palestinians or Arabs <coughs> at the time who were divided between the West Bank and Israel and therefore took on different citizenships and different state positions, despite the fact that prior to that there had never been a border and there was no differentiation between these two populations. From less than a million people today, we have whether you're talking with the occupied territories, without the occupied territories, 
We're talking about 9, 10 million people today. So obviously demography has changed considerably with the basic ratios remaining within Israel uh, roughly, approximately around the 80 to 20 percent mark um, between Israel and the West Bank, between the, let's say, uh, 55, 45, or 58, 42 percent. And of course, that's a major issue as populations grow dynamically. And there is always the argument that, of course, give or take another 20, 30, 40 years with the same population figures, then there's going to be parity between the two populations. Um, so demography has changed. Power has changed very significantly in that 70 years because prior to 1948, you had a British mandate. Um, you had two local populations, a Jewish, a Palestinian Jewish population. The concept of the word Israel only came into being when the state was established, and you had a Palestinian Arab population. Since Israel then later adopted the term Israel, it never used the concept of Palestinian anymore, so the Palestinians became a term which has become only associated with the Arab side of the conflict. But you have a number of elderly people living in Israel today who were alive at the time of the mandate, and they will proudly show and say, look, I have a Palestinian laissez-faire or, 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 uh, um, or passport from the British mandate uh, period. But of course, power sym symmetries have changed considerably because today you have a very strong and sovereign state of Israel. You have a Palestinian population of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip who are stateless. They do not have citizenship. Um, and there is a very different sort of dynamic in terms of power at the time of the British, as the British did everywhere, and I don't need to tell people in India about this. Um, they were very good at playing off the local populations against each other, speaking to them separately and differently, so they would never, God forbid, get together to drive the British out. Um, I think they did that uh, very much so with the Arabs and the Jews in Palestine, with the Muslims and the uh, Hindu and others here in India. Um, and remember that India and Israel became independent within one year of each other, uh, following the departure of the British. There are the size may be hugely different, but there are many other political and historical similarities between the two situations. And both countries, of course, underwent partition as a result of, in India much more directly, in Israel-Palestine after the war of independence, but they both underwent partition um, following their independence. But the scale is something we have to remember. Okay, so demography and power changed significantly. Territory remained the same. Um, unless you're going to start building thousands of square kilometers into the sea, it remains the same 25 square kilometers, 1,000 square kilometers. But of course, the insignificance of a much greater population and different power symmetries means that the dynamics constantly change. Uh, they constantly change um, the growth of settlements, the growth of populations, the growth of political power. Um, and therefore, the one constant remains the territorial constant. Point number three. Um, and I think this is a very important point to talk about because in the last few years, we've been saying a lot about 50 years since the Six-Day War, 70 years since the State of Israel. Actually, last year, last week, sorry, where Israel celebrated its 71st Independence Day. We tend to very blithely use this concept of saying, you know, if and when we get to peace, then there's a default boundary. It's a 1967 boundary. We need to take a picture image of what was there then and go back to that situation. Now, you can be the biggest peacenik, pro-peace activist on the left of Israeli politics that there is, but that is an unrealistic statement to make for a number of reasons. One is because 70 years has passed since the establishment of the state. The 19 years or less than 19 years passed between the establishment of the state and the Six Day War in June 1967. Since 1967, over 50 years has passed. In other words, nearly three times as much time has passed since the Six Day War as existed between the establishment of the state and the Six Day War. And in that 50 years, many things on the ground have changed. I'm not saying that they are morally justified, they are legal, illegal, 
Obviously, depending on your own political positions, you'll adopt a different interpretation of that. But you cannot avoid the fact, and I say this as a past geographer, that when you've had 50 years of building infrastructure and roads and settlements and public institutions, that changes the nature of the geographical and geopolitical landscape to a great extent. And it's not something that can be blithely wiped out. It's not something you can say that, okay, everything between 48 and 67 was legitimate, therefore it's permanent. Everything from 67 until today is legitimate or illegitimate question mark and is all temporary. 70 years doesn't give you temporariness, it gives you permanence. And therefore, when you come into discussing future borders and future territorial arrangements, you have to take the realities of the geographical situation today. You have to barter, you have to negotiate, you have to exchange, you have to compromise. But you have to accept that the realities have changed very significantly and it's a very blithe thing always to go back and say, well, let's go back, take a picture of where we were in 67 and automatically go back there. Time doesn't allow you, time and geographical change on the ground doesn't allow you to do that. Um, point number four, or was that for three or four? Um, point, or the next point to make <laughs> um, is to say that um, over the past 25 years since the Oslo agreements, we've spent a lot of time talking about borders. Let me just race through to the next one I want to show you. And um, I think many of you are familiar with this here. You have a small piece of territory where the borders have changed so constantly. You know, you look at the second map, which was the Unscot partition proposal. You look at the third map, which is the actual partition of Israel-Palestine that resulted from the war, remember that Israel's territorial posture would have been a lot, lot worse had the partition proposal been accepted by all sides and had that been the eventual map of the state of Israel. Um, it's very interesting that the famous Israeli diplomat, Abba Eban, when he was in America at the beginning of the 50s, and he was the young, he was in his 30s, that's all, and he was the first ambassador of Israel to both the United States and to United Nations. Think of that, at the age of 30, taking on such a task. Um, he once wrote to Ben-Gurion, this is written in one of his autobiographies at least, and said, look, this was about 1952, four years after the establishment of the state, and he said, look, maybe we didn't plan for our borders to work out in the way they did, but there was a war, these are the armistice lines, now let's sue for peace, let's go to the Arab nations and say this is a reality, let's talk peace and let's um, determine that these boundaries are internationally recognized boundaries. Um, and Ben-Gurion turned around according to what Abba Ebam writes and said no. He said better they remain as armistice lines, that way they are more flexible so that if in the future some changes come about this would be, in a sense, more legitimate. I don't know if that's the right word to use. And, of course, no one could have prophesied that 15 years later there would be the Six-Day War, which would bring that into effect. Not that the world accepts Israel's control of the occupied territories, but think how much even more difficult and more critical it would be had these been internationally recognized um, boundaries. As it was, of course, in 1952, the Arab states weren't interested in doing business with Israel, so, you know, it was never a discussion that took place. Um, we go through other periods of borders as well here. But, as I say, in the last 25 years, we have spent a lot of time talking about borders because we've spent a lot of time talking about the potential of a two-state solution. Um, and if you look at this caricature here, um, I collect border caricatures, by the way, not just of Israel-Palestine, of all border situations, if any of you come across interesting caricatures about borders, if they're from South Asia, if they're from India, Pakistan, from the, anywhere in the world, look up my email and send them to me, please. <laughs> okay, I'm interested in them. Uh, but caricatures tell you a lot about political realities. I mean, they are humorous on the one hand, but they tell you a lot about what people think about different political situations. If you look today at the number of caricatures about Brexit and migration in Europe and borders in Europe, 
you'll see a lot of this thinking taking place. So here we have Independence Day 45. So that already is 25 years ago. Oslo was 25 years ago when we were all euphoric because we were convinced that Israel and Palestine were going to have a peace agreement. Uh, maybe we were naive, but things didn't quite work out that way. And here you have the map of the state of Israel on the weighing scales with a rather extended stomach, like the one that I have. Um, and he has a very severe looking coach or trainer who, if you remember, was Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin at the time. And a lot of spectators, Yasser Arafat, President Assad the father, King Hussein the father, and the Prime Minister or President of Lebanon. And basically the map of Israel is saying to these coaches, how much of this shape do I have to change in order to satisfy all of those people sitting around? And basically that's been the question back to the 1930s. How do you create the sort of territorial situation which enables both sides to be equally dissatisfied? There's no such thing as equal satisfaction. There's no, if one side is totally satisfied, it means that the other side is totally dissatisfied. You have to have equal dissatisfaction for good conflict resolution, and each side has to believe that the other side has given up as much, has given up something as important as my own side has given up in order for that conflict resolution to be reached. And you'll note that I always use the term conflict resolution and not peace agreement because peace is a much <coughs> bigger thing. Um, it's a much more abstract concept. It sort of uh, assumes that we all suddenly love each other and we trade with each other and we interact with each other. Um, but you have to first of all reach conflict resolution. I think one of the reasons we've been so dissatisfied with the way that the peace processes have all collapsed is because we expected too much to happen in too short a term, plus the fact that the peace spoilers on both sides did their very best to ensure that it would fail. Um, and there were peace spoilers on both sides, very different types of peace spoilers, which we don't have the time to discuss right now. So there have been many attempts to draw, redraw the line um, since that sort of reality of uh, the Oslo came in. But of course, borders are very complex processes. Here you see another caricature of Rabin and Arafat trying to draw a border. It's not just a question of drawing a single line, because different functions have different borders. One border is for security, a different border is for identity, a different border is for citizenship, a different border is for water, a different border is for strategic issues, a different border is for transportation infrastructure. Now, if it was as complex as that caricature would indicate 25 years ago, think how much more complex it's become today. Think of the fact that if today there are 500,000 almost Israeli stroke Jewish resident stroke settlers of the West Bank, not including East Jerusalem, there was less than half that number at the time of the Oslo Accords. Um, so that's one of the points I made about geographical realities changing the situation. Um, settlements do impact upon borders. They do impact on the ability to make a peace agreement. And the more that there are on the ground, the more complex and the more difficult it becomes over time. As I say, borders are not simplistic. It's not just drawing a single straight line. It's much more complex than that. If you look at the Oslo map here, then what you see is, of course, that um, the Oslo agreements were uh, transitory agreements. They weren't permanent agreements. What they did was they divided up the West Bank into three different territorial zones. Um, areas A, Areas B, and Area C. Areas A were the full Palestinian autonomy, which included um, about 20 plus percent of the territory, but about 70 to 80 percent of the population. All the major urban areas like Jericho, Ramallah, um, Jenin, Hebron, or, and so on, or Al Khalil, uh, and so on. Areas B were the rest of the Palestinian villages which had a larger area with a smaller population. And area C 
where Israel retained total control, the white areas you see there, including all of the Jordan Valley, because at the time the concept of um, the Jordan Valley being Israel's eastern defensible border was still very much um, a concept. Netanyahu has brought it back a bit, but that has disappeared over time because the technology of warfare has changed. Today we live in an era of missiles from the Gaza Strip, from Lebanon, 20 years ago, 30 years ago from Iraq, and borders don't provide that function anymore. Borders don't stop missiles. Wherever you build it, whether you build a wall or a fence or anything else, borders don't stop the simplest of missiles. As unfortunately, we know, particularly if, as I do, we live in the south of the country, um, and so, but borders have many other functions. That doesn't mean to say borders are insignificant. They don't have the same security function they once had um, and because any form of missile simply goes beyond the border. And today, the way to deal with these missiles is by all sorts of sophisticated anti-ballistic missile technology, iron dome policies, um, and, uh, <coughs> and so on. So the issue of whether the Jordan Valley really represents any form of defensible border for Israel today, if you go back to the 70s and you read the famous paper by Yigal Alon in Foreign Affairs, the case for defensible borders, then it was very significant. Today that's very questionable, not just in Israel, but all over the world. What is the security function, of, um, a security function against armies and missiles? Against infiltration, that's something different which is why Israel, rightly or wrongly, built the security barrier, the separation fence. And here you see another map of the same thing. Uh, the fact that it says B'Tselem at the bottom, which is, of course, a human rights organization, is meaningless. This is a map from the Foreign Office site, um, and which all groups, left and right wing, tended to adopt um, at one point. And this is already going back 10 years, this map. And again, you see the different colors the sort of cheeseboard territories which were, uh, which were created as a result of Oslo, the idea being at Oslo that within five years, the five big issues, Jerusalem borders, um, refugees, water, what's the one I've missed out? Security. As a, uh, it was, no, uh, whatever. The five big issues were to be discussed and finalized within five years. Um, during that five years, the peace spoilers on both sides did their best to destroy the peace process. Um, and as such, uh, it's very questionable, and this is not just a question with regard to Israel-Palestine, whether interim agreements are really beneficial when you still have large groups or intent on ensuring that the conflict retain, or it consists of. Uh, that's a very important point to make because as I'm going to make my final comments at the end of this presentation, I just want to make a few comments about what we think may happen over the next six months a year with the Trump peace proposal and whether this should be a big proposal or whether it should be an interim. Interim always allows for time. Time on the one hand allows you to work things out if you want to work things out, but time also allows you to destroy processes if that is what the intention of radicals on both sides um, are about. There's another issue to do with the West Bank Territory, and that is it's to do with terminologies and with polemics. Um, think of a single English word, the word whole, W-H-O-L-E. Israel says, wow, look at those Palestinians. They're not prepared to give up anything. They want the whole of the West Bank. They're not prepared to give up a single centimeter of territory. The Palestinians say, um, look at those Israelis. They want the whole of the West Bank, even though the West Bank is only 23% of Mandate Palestine. We already gave up on 75% of Mandate Palestine. All we have left is the West Bank, but the Israelis want the whole of that. So even in a simple word, there are two completely contrary definitions of what that means in terms of the territorial proposal. But over the past 25 years, there has been a lot of discussion about how can you redraw or recreate boundaries so that it would be satisfactory under the context of a, um, a two-state solution. Um, and there has been serious discussion 
about the concept of territorial exchange, which um, certainly 10 years ago, it was on the uh, agenda of many track two discussions which were taking place. I took part in some of these discussions with academics, with politicians and diplomats. It obviously changed over time. It's very interesting that the new president, or the new prime minister, sorry, of the Palestinian Authority, Mohammed Ashtaya, he and I were present at one of the very first track twos that ever took place back in 1990, even prior to the Madrid talks. And we were the two people who presented then a very simple version of a map which said, let's redraw the boundary in such a way as to create territorial exchanges. It was a very crude map, but the principles have remained with us until today. The idea being that if in 1948 the Green Line border was not a good border, it reflected the realities, the military realities, the geopolitical realities of that, of that time. And clearly by 67 it had changed, and by today it's changed even more considerably. So if you're going to go into a peace agreement, you want to at least try and reach, as I said, um, a solution in which both sides are equally dissatisfied, but which more relates to realities of today than relates to realities of 70 years ago. Um, and the basic principle behind the idea of land exchanges or territorial exchanges was that there are significant Israeli settlement blocks many of them, most of them, in very close proximity to the Green Line because the majority of Israelis were prepared to cross the Green Line, some for ideological reasons, true, but many for economic reasons. So they wanted to remain as close as possible to Israel, not to go in the heartland of the West Bank. So, they, so the big areas like Gush Etzion, of El Kanav, of Ariel, are all very, very close to the Green Line. And the idea was, as you can see, and this is just one example of many, that you redraw the boundary to include many of the major settlement blocks inside Israel, but in return for which you give up areas of relatively empty territory in Israel so that the ratio, the 23-77% of territory, remains the same for both sides. That was the first discussion that ever took place between Balian and Abu Mazen back so long ago and which has repeated itself in many variations as such. Of course, the question of where the empty territory to exchange exists um, is another question altogether. There are two major potential areas. One is in the south, near where I live, which is emptier on the Israeli side than anywhere else. That's one potential. Um, there was a discussion at the time of expanding the Gaza Strip because the Gaza Strip um, is one of the most crowdly and densely populated regions in the world um, along the Egypt-Israel Egypt, uh, Egypt uh, Gaza Strip border. And then, of course, there was also the idea of the northern areas at the north. Um, if, you, is this what, if you look up this area here, um, which includes, um, which is called the Triangle, the Mishulash, which includes Arab-Palestinian communities on both sides. And you had a right-wing minister who's probably going to come back into the new government now, Avigdor Lieberman, who, of course, was always opposed to the idea of a Palestinian state. But he, at one point, 10 years ago, when there was greater consensus for the two-state solution than there is today, um, said, you know, I'm against it, but if it's going to be, if there is going to be territorial exchange, I want it to take place here so we'll redraw the boundary in such a way that many of the Palestinian Arab communities that are in Israel today will now find themselves on the West Bank side, the Palestinian state, and instead of a demographic ratio of 80 to 20, there'll be a demographic ratio of 90 to 10. And yet in all public surveys of the Israeli citizenship Palestinian population, it's very clear that they have no desire to be part. They support, obviously, the Palestinian cause, as you would expect them to do, um, but they do not wish, certainly not in the first stages, to be part of a Palestinian state when they see what is going on with Hamas and uh, the Palestinian Authority. Maybe what happened in Gaza could happen in the West Bank. And, of course, uh, they have been subject to very different westernization processes as part of Israel over the last 70 years. And, therefore, they're not particularly keen to do that. In a sense, and this isn't the topic of my discussion, but I'll just make a side comment and say, but of course, the 
Palestinian citizenship of Israel is in a very, uh, if I can use a British understatement, as you can see from my accent, I'm originally from Britain. I've lived in Israel for 35 years, but I'm originally from North London. Um, they're in a very difficult situation because many people used to say, oh, look, they've now lived for two or three generations as part of Israel. They could create a sort of a bridge between Palestinians and Israelis. But in reality, neither side trusts them. The Israelis, many Israelis, see them as a fifth column. Yes, they're part of the process. They sit in the Knesset and, uh, and so on. But nevertheless, they feel themselves to be discriminated. They feel themselves to be second-class citizens. And many Israelis see them you know, as a potential fifth column. And therefore, they've never been included in any Israeli government, even a left-wing government. Equally, the Palestinians don't totally trust them. They see them as having been too subject to the westernization uh, tendencies of education systems, of modernization as part of Israeli culture and society over the last 70 years, and they don't see them as trustworthy enough to be the, you know, the real allies um, as creating a bridge. So they've always been in that very unfortunate situation. And what is very unfortunate is that whereas until about 15 years ago, they used to participate very fully in Israeli election processes with some of the highest participation rates in a country which has the high participation rates anyway, over the last 10, 15 years, they've been withdrawing from the electoral process. Their participation rates are much lower. And this is actually, I feel, a danger to Israel's democracy in the way that even the sensitive and the problematic way that exists today of what their role and status is uh, within Israel society. Um, having said that, um, we have been building borders and walls over the last 15 years, the separation barrier and, and, and so on. Um, whether this is uh, beneficial or not depends, I think, to a great extent on the political perspective you look at. It certainly has created a physical barrier between Israel and the West Bank, which means that on the one hand, it may have kept potential infiltrators out, maybe, um, on the, uh, out, but equally, um, on the other hand, it has caused all sorts of new issues, not least of which is the fact that the average Israeli Jewish citizen, who unless you're a settler or someone serving the army, never crosses into the West Bank, even though you live 20 minutes away, but you sit very comfortably in the high quality coffee houses of North Tel Aviv, forgetting that there's a conflict so close by, or that there are missiles from Gaza. What woke the Israeli public up recently was one missile that came virtually into the center of the country, which is not difficult to do, by the way. Um, that woke people up. So, oh, no, that's something that goes on away from us in the periphery, even though the periphery is pretty close. But today, if you're driving along the Cross Israel Highway, north to south or south to north, and you look out your window, you see the fence, you see the wall, which means that there is a much more realistic discourse about what borders mean. You see a border, therefore you talk about it, you become aware of it, and therefore there is a much greater, or there has been until recently, a much greater dis discourse about borders than there were 20 or 30 years ago. Building walls, of course, is uh, questionable, and here you have a great caricature from just two years ago when Trump came to Jerusalem. He was the first American president to visit the Western Wall. As you know, people who visit the Western Wall write notes to God and stick them in the wall. And uh, Trump at the time was talking about, as he still is today, building a big wall between the USA and Mexico. And he said, thank you, Jesus, for building this wall that keeps the Mexicans out of Israel. He got a bit um, um, confused as to what it was. But this is the one I like. Another, you know, everyone's trying to second guess what did he write on his note. Dear God, please send me the name of the contractor who built this wall. It's lasted for 3,000 years, and look at it. I have a similar project and would like a quote to build uh, my own wall. Humorous, yes, but it says something about the way that walls and borders have come uh, back to haunt us in the contemporary era.
There is a lot of talk, there is a lot of rumor going around that Trump has a peace proposal and that now the elections are behind us. Netanyahu, I think, is very close to putting his new coalition government into effect. It's a very right of center government. If it's 10 years ago he was the extreme right winger in a government, today he's a moderate right winger in a government of many more extreme politicians. Um, the two state solution is not really out there on the table. It wasn't an issue, it wasn't discussed anywhere in the election process um, uh, this coming year. And we don't know really what the Trump proposal is. The rumors that have come out have said that it's going to be a much more limited version than maybe was being suggested 20 years ago or 15 years ago when Barack was prime minister and, uh, and so on. So it's very hard to believe that the Palestinians would be prepared to accept any such uh, uh, proposal as such. Because if Trump was to put something on the table, it would be very hard for Netanyahu to turn around and just say no. Trump and Netanyahu are best buddies. Netanyahu and Obama weren't. Netanyahu is a buddy with Trump. He's a buddy with Putin. He's a buddy with Modi. You know, he's got, uh, you may like or dislike his particular policies, but he's worked hard in the international arena. Um, and he portrayed that during the elections as an experienced leader who's been prime minister for now 10 years, nearly oh, as long as David Ben-Gurion, the state founder, which is quite amazing. Um, and, but it's going to be very hard for him to turn around to his best buddy, Donald Trump, particularly given the fact that in the last two years, Donald Trump has given Netanyahu and Israel a lot of very nice sweets and a lot of, a lot of very nice presents moved the embassy to Jerusalem, no previous American president ever did that, said that maybe Israel has a right to claim sovereignty over the Golan Heights because of uh, strategic issues, that's changed the ball game, um, hasn't really said much about Netanyahu's statements that maybe it's time to annex parts of the West Bank, which Israel has never done in the past, mostly because of demographic issues. So. To turn around and then say to Trump, no, I don't, I'm not prepared to withdraw, to give up anything, um, or to go according to peace plan is going to be much more difficult for Netanyahu than it was when he was talking to uh, President Obama. And this is, of course, one of the great unknowns that we don't know. And we're waiting to see whether all these rumors about what we understand is quite a detailed peace plan is going to materialize or not over the next few months. My final comment about drawing borders and territory is to say that, of course, uh, we do live, as I said at the beginning, in a small piece of territory with an increasing number of people. <laughs> there have been countless proposals at redrawing borders. And, of course, in today's world, what we believe in discussing, certainly at the theoretical or philosophical levels, is why do we need separate spaces? Why can't we create shared spaces? Um, spaces where peoples can live, with a separation of power, um, but they don't necessarily need fences. Not always, if you know the famous poem of Robert Frost, good fences make good neighbors, but if you have good neighbors, you don't necessarily need good fences. And um, that's the other side of that famous statement. Of course, it is so intricate today, not just the Israeli settlements, that's one factor, 500,000. No left-wing government could forcefully evacuate 500,000 settlers. And there's not a left-wing government, and you saw that the left completely collapsed in this past election. I mean, it was an election between center and right, and the left weren't in there at all. Um, to, and there are many reasons to explain this. Maybe Asher Sussa spoke about it, I don't know. But um, that's a whole other lecture to talk about. Um, but shared spaces is a very nice concept. You can have it maybe to a certain extent in a Western Europe, even with Brexit, um, which, but on the whole, is at peace with itself and lives in relative, relative harmony and stability compared to where it was after World War II, 70 years ago. You don't have that in Israel-Palestine. But one of the questions that many of us who have supported and promoted the two-state solution for many years as the best of all the bad proposals is that have the realities on the ground changed so much that it is no longer possible to draw a simple border. In which case, 
Are there ways of thinking beyond the territorial box whereby you don't create borders, you don't draw lines, but you have enclaves and exclaves and power sharing and alternative citizenships? That's much more complex. And given the animosity and the hatred that exists between the two sides, probably even more difficult um, to see materializing. But the question that many of us who are pragmatists not ideologues who oppose two-state solutions for ideological reasons. <coughs> Far right in Israel because they believe the whole of the land was given to the Jewish people by God, therefore there shouldn't be another state. Or the far left or many of the Palestinians who believe we're in a post-nation state era, therefore there should be a single binational secular democracy which should neither be Jewish or Muslim, uh, um, uh, etc. Those are ideological positions. But many of us who have always promoted the two-state solution as the best of all the bad solutions believe that it's no longer possible to draw these boundaries and therefore we have to think beyond the territorial box. It sounds very far-reaching, it sounds very fictional, but crazier things have happened in the history of the Israel-Palestine conflict. Thank you. Newman for your very excellent theorizing the border and um, I often tell my students that you've got to have humor when you do geopolitics and IR and I do uh, you do uh, at, the, at the cost of some believers I do, do mock some aspects of geopolitics and the divine it's inevitable and the fact that you know you can write about it and theorize about it it's just amazing so um, going on the idea of shared spaces. So it's interesting when we look at the concept of ethnocracy in Israel, because uh, which is about sharing spaces, which is often written by Yiftakel. Um, we look at the idea of how pragmatically one can negotiate identities at borders, how, how also the border can become an aspect of imagination, but at the end of the day, it has to it has to work for entities on either sides, um, and of course, it being the challenge to sovereignty. But but in in this context, moving on within the contemporary lines, uh, what if a strong economic development plan uh, factors in <coughs> to the uh, from the U.S. that that which is often you know this is this is the speculation that there will be a strong economic development plan. There, there, is a, there is a thing there, there's a card there, yes. Uh, which, can, which can challenge this question of uh, opportunity, capitalism, identity, all you know, within the idea of borders and exchange. So what, what I mean, it's speculation, of course, but if you yeah. can Well, uh, first of all, I'm glad you mentioned my very close friend and colleague, Oren Yiftachel. Actually, on the way here from Delhi, I was SMSing with him. Right. He's yeah. in London right now, but nothing to do with Israel-Palestine. Um, he is. Uh, well, he. he about Israel um, but no, for uh, um, well, we often discuss soccer in London. Not very uh, well. But um, <laughs> but <laughs> completely yeah, different. I'm on my way for the first time in my life to Australia, and he is in a sense half Australian. He spends a lot of his time there. His wife's Australian. And I was asking him for the best tourist routes in in Australia. But that's what you can do in globalization. You can sit in a car from Delhi. With a, with a mobile phone, speak to your Israeli colleague who happens to be in London right now and discuss how to travel in Australia. That's the wonders, the miraculous wonders of globalization. And we as social scientists, we just know that it works. We don't understand how it works, at least I don't, but it works and it's amazing. Um, and of course, globalization crosses borders. Cyberspace crosses borders, which is one of the reasons we've had this borderless world discourse of the past 30 or 40 years. Look, for any conflict resolution or peace agreement, whatever we want to call it to work, you have to have uh, quality of life uh, considerations of which economics is a lot about it. The difference, I mean, Israel enjoys an extremely high quality of life. And one of the reasons there aren't huge demonstrations from the left, for, you know, uh, every week saying, let's have a peace proposal, let's sort it out, is one of the reasons is because Israelis are having a good life at the moment. And there aren't major, so, I mean, there aren't major security threats every day and every night. 
The missiles, thank God, are not falling on Tel Aviv. Um, and um, as long as Israel, I, I, the average Israeli, whether he be a left winger or a right winger, is comfortable with the way the situation, the conflict is managed, then that's good for them. But with all of Israel's high quality of life, the differential between Israel and the West Bank is 1 to 17. It may have gone up to 1 to 20. It's a huge differential. And I don't want to say what it is today with the Gaza Strip, where it's become far worse, which is why a lot of the local population in the Gaza Strip are now dissatisfied with the Hamas, because the Hamas promised them not just political solutions, but better economic situations. Not only is the economic situation worse, but every time rockets are fired, Israel, of course, retaliates. Um, the damage caused by Israel is far greater, causes tremendous economic disruption. And as an aside, I want to say that uh, there is no such thing as proportionality in warfare. It's, it's, it's a ridiculous argument. Whatever side of the conflict you're on, uh, governments don't respond and say, you fired three missiles today, I'm going to fire three missiles today. You fired two yesterday, I'm going to fire two. It doesn't work that way. I would say even more, if there was proportionality, in other words, where missiles were fired blindly, from one side. If Israel was just to say, okay, they fired 100 missiles blindly today, I'm going to fire 100 missiles blindly back into the Gaza Strip. I don't even want to start to think what the impact of that would be. Far, far greater and worse than anything that is happening by Israel's response today. But there has to be economics on the other side. I remember when Peres, even before he was president, when he used to get very involved, President um, Shimon Peres, in peace-related issues. And at certain points, he went around the world trying to drum up support for the Palestinian economy. And people used to say to him, look, it's one thing that you want to promote peace. But why? It's not your job to go and promote the Palestinian economy. That's not your job. The Palestinians can do that. And his answer was, he says, because that's part of making peace. I want the other side to be enjoying a quality of life which makes them more satisfied with what's happening because when you're dissatisfied, when you're unemployed, when you're in a very bad situation, you become very politically frustrated and you turn your political frustrations onto the political arena. At least your leaders try to make you do that. So it's in my interest, Israel's interest, to ensure that the economy of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip is far, far better so that people have greater quality of life satisfaction because if we get any conflict resolution into place, we want it to remain in place. We don't want it to disrupt or destroy um, within the next five or, or, or ten years. So obviously economics is an extremely important part of any com long-term conflict resolution. I think the first stages of conflict resolution have to be to determine that the Palestinians have some sovereignty. I don't think autonomy is sufficient. They have contiguous territory. And you have to get through at least one, if not two, generations of children who grew up, grow up on either side of not being afraid, on the one hand, of terrorist bombs happening on their buses or in their schools or in their shopping malls, and on the other side of seeing Israeli soldiers patrolling the entrance to your village or tanks coming in to search for people. You have to have the sense of safety and security. And if you watch this documentary afterwards, which we made, about the impact of the Israel-Palestine separation barrier on Israeli and Palestinian kids living in the West Bank, you see that they have mirror images of the sense of fear, the sense of threat they feel from the other side. That's the first stages of conflict resolution, to get rid of that sense of fear. And at that time, you have to work on all sorts of other grassroots issues, not least the economic situation, improving the economic situation of a new Palestinian entity or state. Right, can I open the floor to questions? Yeah. Introduce, I don't think the mic's, I think I've got to check what's happening on the, um, in, the pop, in the box down there. But anyway, just speak loudly, introduce yourself, the course you're doing, and then stay here. I'm Inka. I'm studying Masters in Diplomacy Law and Business. I'm the last semester to just finish my dissertation. So my question is on the famous uh, social science debate on center versus peripheral states. Oh, sorry. On the center versus peripheral states. Center versus periphery, yeah. yeah. 
So, uh, as we know, the peripheral states are comparatively economically, socially, and politically deprived with the war and the ongoing missile attacks and you know, the conflict situation. So, is there a differential economic development plan in place or a future plan for to uplift the peripheral communities? Well, this is an issue within Israel, um, regardless of the conflict, the question of how the center and the periphery are developed. There's always been uh, this idea in Israel that people need to go and settle in the periphery, whether it be in the Galilee or the Negev. But in reality, in what is a very small country, people have always opted for the center, which is, of course, why Tel Aviv has now become such a high-rise um, uh, center. And remember, because distances are so small, um, on the new highways and on the new railway system, I mean, from most places in the country, you get from what we call the periphery, the Negev or the Galil, within an hour, an hour and a half into the centre. You know, uh, again, crossing uh, half of Delhi um, uh, and so on, that sort of same time scale. Um, there is an argument, um, there was a well known political geographer by the name of John House, who in the early 80s developed the concept of double peripherality. The idea being that in the geographic periphery, you tend to meet also the various social and political peripheries. Um, now, there can be, and I don't want to sort of over-theorize here, but there can be the concept of in every periphery there is a center. So you have a, a, you know, a political center, an economic center in the periphery, such as the kibbutzim used to be in the geographical periphery. And in every center, you also have peripheries, the uh, low-class neighborhoods of Tel Aviv and so on. So there's an overcrossing of these things. And there is the additional argument, which has been made by some, including myself, that actually the development of the West Bank has been at the um, uh, cost of the periphery because those governments that have promoted West Bank settlements, particularly right-wing governments, have given them all the sorts of incentives and benefits that you normally reserve for the periphery. But the actual location is in the geographic center of the country. It's in the commuter belt of Tel Aviv and the Jerusalem. The only reason it wasn't settled prior to 67 was because it was part of the West Bank, which was under Jordanian administration. But otherwise, it would have been the natural area for development to take place rather than along the coastal plain, north, uh, north to south. So there's this concept of double centrality, which says this even takes more resources away from the periphery, although it's not an argument which has been successfully used, I must admit, by the, by the political left. It has been used, but not tremendously successfully. And therefore, if you are not opposed ideologically to living in the West Bank, and you are faced with all sorts of incentives and economic benefits, which otherwise you would only get if you went to the Negev or the Galil, a lot of people are going to get up and take those uh, benefits, which is one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons which explains why the settlement population has grown and is continuing to grow to something like half, um, half a million people. Plus the fact that if the rockets from South Lebanon or from the Gaza Strip are falling in this geographic periphery, Sederot or Nativot, or even Beersheva, where my university is, on a number of occasions we have to close down the university and the schools for fear that stray rockets may hit you know, a class full of students or children, which would be the worst thing, um, or the same in the north, then of course that's happening in the periphery, not in the center. But as we saw recently, a rocket did fall in the center, and there's no question that given the very small distances, geographic distances, most of the rockets from the Hezbollah and the Hamas today could easily fall in Tel Aviv and Rehovot. That's not a big deal, 40, 60 kilometers. And it seems to me, and I'm not saying this with any authoritative knowledge, but it seems to me that there, is, there are limits, there are unstated agreements, because if rockets were to start falling like that in Tel Aviv, then clearly the Israeli response you know, would be, that a gr much bit greater, which then in turn, the residents of the periphery say, ah, if you're only going to respond like that, then why aren't you responding like that now? And there's been a lot of criticism of the Netanyahu government who are hardliners for not responding hard enough. But nevertheless, the people still voted quite considerably for Netanyahu as Mr. Security um, in the recent elections. So there is a very interesting core periphery debate taking place here, parallel to the political debate itself.
or in fact, electoral process. My only point is, how does region politics navigate, how does democracy navigate with region and politics, and with democracy being deemed mostly secular? So, how does the navigation happen? How does it will live? Because the similar uh, case also like came up with political Islam, with when some scholars argued that political Islam will never turn into modern democracy, because uh, religion cannot take, religion cannot navigate with democracy. Religion cannot be a parallel to democracy. No, how does okay, happen? well, do we have another three hours? <laughs> to, to, um, I'll just make a few comments. Obviously, this is another whole question, um, not so much to focusing on the territorial. Look, Israel is defined or defines itself as a Jewish state and as a democratic state. And there is clearly um, some sort of structural contradiction between the two. I don't think Israel does badly, given the context of the conflict. And I think we have to, even someone like me, who is critical of occupation and believes we have to have a real about turn, which is not going to happen, by the way, in the near future. There's not going to be, as we saw in this election, there's not going to, there is no majority for left of center government um, in Israel today or in the next few years. Um, the left have to get their act together and create a viable and alternative challenge and leadership, which they um, miserably failed to do in the last few years. Um, but having said that, Israel is deemed as the Jewish state, the Jewish homeland, where 80% of the population are Jewish. Um, it sees itself certainly as a democracy, and I think along many or most of the criteria of what constitutes a democracy, and given the context of a conflict, it certainly doesn't do bad. We have free elections, there is freedom of expression, Arab Palestinians do run for political uh, party and they can sit in the Knesset and stand up and say we don't believe in the legitimacy of this state and they have the right to do so. Although they did not do well in this particular, um, uh, in this particular election um, because they didn't get their, their act together as the ultra-orthodox parties did. The ultra-orthodox parties have 16 members of the new Knesset. The Arab parties only have five or six. But that's not because that's their demographic problem. That's for two reasons. One, they had low participation rates, whereby the orthodox voters, their rabbis told them to vote, so they went 100% or 90% they voted. And two, because the religious parties realized that with the lower threshold laws, they needed to go in one or two large parties rather than fragment. The Arab parties did that last time around, they didn't do it this time, and they failed miserably. In other words, they didn't play the democracy game, the political game, very well. Maybe that was a conscious decision on their part by choosing to withdraw more from the political process, but clearly they're in a much weaker position in this new government than they were even in, um, even in the uh, past government. Now. Um, there is clearly a difference. Uh, everyone has equal citizenship status. But there is clearly a different status, if you're, particularly if you're coming from outside Israel, whether you're Jewish or you're not Jewish. Because as a Jew, you have the right, automatic right of return. I think the only few exceptions in the history of Israel where this has been rejected for someone is where on a number of occasions, uh, big gangsters or mobsters who are Jewish seeking to evade American or European justice have asked for Israeli citizenship and Israel has drawn a line and said that's not why we're around, that's not why we're here. But if you are born with a Jewish um, heritage, um, again there are differences of opinion as to what constitutes that heritage, whether it's an orthodox definition or a cultural definition, you have the right of automatic return and Israel is always promoting the idea the Jews should go and live in Israel. I went to live in Israel um, 35 years ago because I grew up in a very strongly Jewish and Zionistic background, not because of anti-Semitism, definitely not. Um, and it was always an option for me, and it worked for me and many of my family. Um, and with all the problems there are in Israel and all the critique that we have, I mean, I can't think for myself personally of a better decision I made um, at any point. But that's for Jewish reasons, not necessarily for nationalistic. Um, reasons. Clearly this new national or nation state law is problematic. It was unnecessary. Let, let's use another one of these um, um, British understandings. It was unnecessarily. It didn't really change in a big way the status of the people, but it did so in a declarative way. It was more or less saying 
that only Jews really should have rights here. And it was totally unnecessary for it to be done because I say that it didn't change in a big way the real day-to-day -day status of the Arab Palestinians who are residents and are citizens of Israel. Um, but it is indicative of the nature of government that we have in Israel today and for the last five years, which has become increasingly nationalistic, increasingly right of center, and it increasingly wishes to do away with the notion of two-state solutions. Some people would like to extend sovereignty over the West Bank. That is the nature of Israeli policy, polity today. I think it's fair to say that in the last 15 years since the withdrawal from Gaza, Israeli public opinion, who were prepared to give Gaza a chance, and if Gaza had worked out, would have been prepared to give similar things in parts of the West Bank a chance. But when they see it hasn't worked out, when there are rockets coming from Gaza, when there are wars taking place with Gaza, so what has happened to Israeli public opinion is that the left has moved into the center and the center has moved to the right. And as a result of which, you have more of these nationalistic statements and declarations which, in my own personal rather than professional view, are not beneficial to any future form of conflict resolution. This is quite unique in the middle of a lecture to be given sandwiches in the middle, but uh, I, I'm quite happy with it. <laughs> Would you like tea or coffee? I want to do um, uh, Whatever this is is fine. I'll have another one of these. I, I thought, yeah. I thought uh, so take the first one. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Kuren. Uh, I'm doing my final year master's in diplomacy law and business. Uh, apart from people moving to the West Bank for the pur purpose of religion, uh, there are a lot of commoners who settled in West Bank due to increased, uh, increased living expenses in, in the mainland Israel. So, does that create a kind of normalization for people who are settled in, settled in the West Bank region, like normal Israeli citizens in, who are settled in West Bank? Does that create a normal situation that because they are settling there, does it create that, oh, I am a part of the state and this is also like part the greater area of Israel? Does it, for commoner, what, the, what is the perception that he has about... Yeah, okay. So there, there is obviously a dissonance here because if you're an Israeli settler living in the West Bank, you are still an Israeli citizen voting in Israeli elections. But if you're a neighbor in a Palestinian community in the West Bank, you're not an Israeli citizen and you're not taking part in Israeli elections. So you have a dual territory, a dual space there. There is normalization in the extent, in to the extent that... You know, we always use this term settlements, and people who have not visited or don't see pictures still get this image of little huts at the top of a mountain. These are towns and villages, some of them with 20, 30,000 people in them, with roads and very nice suburban houses and schools and shopping centers and industrial centers, no different to anything that happens in Israel. And those which are nearest the old Green Line, where there's no border anymore, you're not even conscious of the fact that you're crossing. So in that sense, you're just part of Israeli society. Yes, it's true that if you are on the other side of the political spectrum, you don't believe in setting the West Bank, and you don't go there, so you don't visit these places. But when you do, all, all you see is, you know, middle-class suburbia, western suburbia, within commuting distance of either Tel Aviv or Jerusalem metropolitan areas. And for those people, it's part of normal Israeli society, unless... You're living way in the interior of the West Bank. And um, then you're very ideologically motivated mm -hmm. because you're not there just for economic reasons. And it can be more difficult and there may be dangers traveling on the road sometimes. As I know when I sometimes drive on the West Bank roads, I have to think, is it safe or isn't it safe to do so on that particular day or that particular week? But overall, these people are part of normalization. What has happened also in the last 10 years is that Today, there are a disproportionate number of settler residents who are members of the Israeli parliament yeah. because they are most ideologically motivated and therefore they get much more involved in politics. And you'll find in all of the right-wing parties, and they don't form their own settler party, but they're spread out amongst the right-wing parties. And today, there is a disproportionate number of settler representation in the government and in the Knesset than there ever has been in the past. Maybe a last question from anyone? Yeah. Uh, that apparently we, uh, we have given up on that. Yeah. Uh, my name is Sripati. I'm uh, joined the 
my query is not visa we will be busy but a much larger question is are we in a position wherein uh, the complications of democracy and democratic elections as you said the settler parties or, or those who are into favor of settlers have got a disproportionate higher percentage of uh, presence in the Israeli parliament because they are more committed. Oh, well, who? The, the right wing? Yeah, the right wing. Uh, so it, that, that, that is purely a, a complication of democracy where it is a question of which section or of the political spectrum is more committed at the arithmetic of election. Uh, does that, do you think, will now dictate geography? Which has, well, which has uh, been the case. With, thus far, by and large, in most of the conflicts, geography and disputes has been dictating politics. But now will we come in a position where politics alone will now dictate job? I don't think you can ever say that one dictates the other. It, it's a two-way process. I mean, you know, there's a feedback effect here. But I think it's true of all democracies and electoral systems anywhere that often smaller, smaller parties who are more ideologically motivated and, and more radical in their positions tend to have higher participation and higher activist levels. Um, Forget Israel for a moment. Think about the whole Brexit debate in England. Yeah. And uh, how once again now, even if you're looking at the news day, now Farage has got a new Brexit party going and there's huge support for this party in the European elections because this is a very clearly defined ideological position. Um, now, within Israel-Palestine, you have, in a sense, the pro-peace, the peace now position on the far left and you have the pro-settler position on the far right. Um, the pro-settler position, I suppose, if we were to retrospect, the pro-settler position in political terms has been much more successful than the pro-peace term. Um, going back almost 20 years now, or even more, um, a professional colleague, Professor Tamar Herman and myself, she wrote a thesis on the Peace Now movement. I wrote a thesis on the right-wing settler Gush Emunim movement. We wrote a comparative piece in Middle Eastern studies. And although we were both personally on the left of the political spectrum, we both came to the conclusion that even then, 25 years ago, it had been the right wing and Gush Emunim which were more successful because they had been much more proactive. Also because they had something very tangible to do, build settlements. Whereas, in a sense, what the Israeli public defined the left of center peace now was dismantled settlements. There's always something perceptually more acceptable about something which you're building than something you're destroying. It wasn't able to get over the image that what we are building is we're building peace, but we're destroying settlements, you know. So from that point of view, that's always been the case. And at the time of Oslo, there was a great amount of despondency amongst the settler movement who felt that they had failed. They felt that they had failed in their objective to eventually create sovereignty over the whole of the West Bank. There was a famous statement of one of the settlement leaders at the time of Oslo, which said, um, we have, the Hebrew term for the settlements is the Hitnachalut. Um, a, a, a translation of that term is to squat. So it's taken from the Bible. It's from the biblical terminology where, the, where Joshua came from the exodus of Egypt and created Hitnachalut in the land of Israel. That's the term, and that's the image they wanted to create because they always want the connection with the biblical uh, uh, attachment to an association with the land of Israel. And a settlement leader at the time of Oslo was quoted as saying, we have succeeded in squatting Hitnachalut in the territory, but not in the hearts of the people of Israel. They don't support us. Therefore, in a sense, we have failed to achieve our dream. But 25 years on, they wouldn't say that anymore. They've shown that time has its own impact. Time has brought the number of settlers from 200,000 to half a million. Give it another 10 years, and that's changed, as you say, the whole geographical reality, making it much more difficult to talk about drawing borders. And they've become much more active, much more present, much more dominant in politics. Even 15 years ago, the settler movement was still considered as the radical right. Today, they're part and party of the right-wing government, which shows how public opinion has shifted and how, as you say, it's become much more normal. Um, and that is a reality of today which we have to deal with. Right, thank you so much for your time. We have our own way of ordination in a way to thank you for your time and all your insights. So.
Oh, wow, what a great scarf. So we have the colors of all the schools. So if I may, uh -huh. just thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you. So this is one of the nicest scarves I've ever received. It's even got my name on. Yes, you own um, it. You own but it. I have to be very honest here and say that um, I have one scarf in life which um, will never, This will. I'm afraid this will be the second most favorite scarf. I am a crazy soccer supporter. Oh, well. Uh, wait, wait, wait. You, you, you haven't heard the end of it yet. I grew up in North London. Uh -huh. Do you guys follow European soccer? Yeah. So I'm in high heaven at the moment. Since the age uh -huh. of five, uh -huh. and I'm now 62, I have supported Tottenham Hotspur. Uh -huh. uh, so you know why I'm in high heaven at the moment, and I wish I could get to Madrid next week. Um, <laughs> however, when I was 11 years old, my grandmother, who knew nothing about soccer, I bought her the wool and I told her how to knit me a Tottenham scarf, a real wool Tottenham scarf. And to this day, it is a scarf I go with to the soccer games. So I will still be going with that scarf to the soccer. But in a cold, wintry winter in London or Jerusalem, maybe I'll wear this one. Thank you. Thank you. And that's just. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So thank you. Shall we just put on this?